Welcome to Digital Asset News, the like top stories in crypto and bring out a bite-sized pieces. Today, just as the thumbnail suggests, we're going to talk about the single biggest mistake crypto or pretty much anybody who's in the market, their biggest mistakes uh, or the one biggest mistake that they make. So we'll take a look at that. We'll take a look at uh, how one of the largest hedge fund managers, Ray Dalio, is now getting into Ethereum, even though he talks about how everything's going to uh, go down and everything's going to be banned. And then also, we're going to talk about how Ethereum is going to be turned into a movie and I got the lady who wrote the script. And lastly, we'll take a look at a project that I think is going to be huge, Everdome. So before we get into all that stuff, first, let's take a look at exactly what is going on into the market. And it's not so pretty. So today, it is Monday. It is the 20th of December. And we got a market cap and an ever-dwindling supply of 2.16 trillion. I don't need to tell you that. I think you know that. I think... Uh, uh, everybody's in a, a pretty funky mood right now, especially because we didn't hit our goals. <laughs> and it's true. And uh, it is never good when we think one thing's going to do something and it goes the opposite way. Hey, I thought we were going to have some fireworks in December. Didn't happen. But as we see in the, in the next uh, uh, piece, doesn't really matter. So 2.16 trillion. I mean, everything's down across the board. I don't think there's anything that's really up majorly today. I don't really see uh, that happening. Let's see. One hour change. Nah, not really. I mean, 1% for chain link. Woo, watch out, 1%. And over the last 24 and seven days, just some pretty abysmal numbers. And that is just, uh, that is the state of the market for what, what we're in. But don't worry. Uh, there's also people that are, are feeling our exact same pain. And then those are the folks over in traditional market space. S&P 500, NASDAQ 100, Dow 30, Russell 2000, US dollar index. Everything is essentially down across the board. There's a number of reasons for that. I mean, we could we could talk about how you know institutional investors are selling off because they had monster years and they're going to come back in. We could talk about how the taxes are you know coming up in in, in America. We're talking about April fifteenth, so they sell right now. They're probably worried about capital gains tax, but in all reality, it doesn't really matter. Does it really matter why people are selling off? They're selling off, and the numbers are there, so we can take a look at why it is, or what we could just do is we could sit back and take some lessons from people who have been there for quite a long time. I've always said this, and I'll say this again, you don't know where you're going until you know where you've been. And to prove my point, uh, there is uh, this gentleman here, uh, Nick Murray, and uh, he is he is the uh, investor, not investor of investors, but as far as like hedge fund managers, he is the advisor to the advisors. So this, I'll just do it real quick. His uh, background, uh, he's the editor of Nick Murray Interactive, uh, started his career as a stockbroker advisor, working in a major Wall Street firm, author of Serious Money, great book, uh, left Wall Street in 92 to help financial planners, author of 11 books, including Simple Wealth, Inevitable Wealth. And I found this gem uh, I found this yesterday, actually, and I had taken a look at his book before, and it really had things just hadn't clicked. And what I'm going to share with you right now is why these things that he's talking about are just the basic principles. Sometimes it's people's jobs to make things more complex than they need to be, but in reality, things just need to boil down to the most simplest parts. And uh, let's just take a listen. Look at the numbers. I mean, in 1975, the S&P 500 was 90. As we're sitting here, it's pushing 2,100. Right. Um, in 1975, there were 4 billion people in the world, and half of them were living in extreme poverty. Today, there's 7 billion people in the world, and, and 1 in 10 is living in extreme poverty. Where did everybody go? Well, everybody went in the middle class. Um, and so you've had the greatest accretion of health and wealth and longevity and everything else, major wars, ending, just just go on and on. So that was essentially just a warm up into the next two pieces, because I'm going to break down this 30 minute video into pretty much just these next two segments, which were uh, about a minute or so or two minutes. And the next one's just about a minute. And what this is, is probably two of the best pieces of advices that I've ever heard and I can probably give to you. And the, and the last one will be the single biggest mistake. So the first thing I want to talk about is, or I'm going to have uh, Nick here talk about, is the, the irrationality of the market. And we see it all around us. It is irrational, especially if we take a look at what he just talks about, optimism. Because if you just take, if you just take a step back and zoom out, like we're going to talk about in a second, these these whole things make sense. So this next piece, it's all about the irrationality and pretty much where we're at right now. Irrationality is the free market operating the way it should. Yeah. Because human nature is irrationality operating the way it should. You, you, you can't look at 
uh, uh, periods of great contraction in the market any more than you can look at periods of huge optimism and say um, this is this is undue irrationalism this is human nature capital like everything else in human nature outruns itself during good periods and outruns itself during bad periods and that's volatility that but if, if you if you focus on those if an investor is allowed to focus on those allowed to focus on the periods of irrationality uh, yes the volatility the volatility right if you focus on the volatility you you miss the picture because the volatility around what excesses of optimism and pessimism around what well the answer to that question is a constantly rising trend line and i think all of the the good investors much less great investors i've ever known or known of concentrated on the constantly rising trend trend line and all of the failed investors i've ever known or known of sooner or later fixated on one of the irrational excesses and let that run his portfolio to his eternal uh, uh, sadness okay doesn't that make sense isn't that what we've been talking about on this channel for the longest time dollar cost average when in doubt zoom out buy the dip it's the same thing that nick has been saying uh for probably decades the different advisors that he's mentored. And I think the biggest thing to, to really make mention of here is just to remember this, this phrase that he talked about, which is don't confuse temporary declines uh, from permanent losses. I think that's a big deal because when people are, you know, spouting off and, and, and talking to their friends and they're like, oh, I lost so much money, I lost so much money. You haven't lost anything as long as you're still in the market. And I think that is the big thing. So just like Nick said, just sometimes just sit back and go, well, I don't have any more money to buy the dip, but all I gotta do is just sit here. And I'm gonna be right here. I'm not gonna move any way, shape, or form because I know in the long run, things will work out. So let me know what you think about that in the comments section. I think it's probably one of the best advice I've heard for a long time. Let's move on to uh, Ray Dalio changes his tune. So I always like it when, uh, when the financial experts, Ray here, really starts to turn around and they kind of like it's like a light bulb goes off and here's what's going on so ray dalio it's very impressive that cryptocurrencies has held up for a decade ray runs the world's largest hedge fund bridgewater associates has been slow to embrace crypto that is very true uh in may he said that which was kind of odd he goes well now i have some bitcoin but he also told uh the interviewer that regulators will kill crypto if it becomes too successful so okay the guy's just you know gambling right but he also predicted predicted in an interview with Yahoo Finance late last year that he didn't think digital currencies would succeed in the way people hoped they would, in part because of the possible government action. And uh, in a separate interview, he said that uh, he thought that Bitcoin would be outlawed. Okay, so that's where, that's where he thought, but he's like, I own a little bit. And now uh, he revealed he's getting deeper and deeper in the pool with an investment in Ethereum in addition to his Bitcoin though he declined to reveal exactly how much. He says, I think it's impressive that for the last 10, 11 years, that programming has still held up. So here's the big thing about this. And Ray might just have a little bit, but in all honesty, if you're talking about it and you're just talking about, well, I got a little bit, usually people like that, for, you know, that have a ton of cash just laying around, maybe Ray, maybe not, um, they probably do have a sizable amount, especially if they're talking about it. So it's amazing how it's like, it's nothing, and it's like, okay, it's something, I'm going to get into it. And then all of a sudden it's like, yeah, it's getting pretty big. And then before you know it, they just go full crypto. And we see it time and time and time again. So anyhow, I thought it was an interesting story about Ethereum, which will lead me into my next piece where we talk about Ethereum. The movie is coming out. And what I've, uh, actually it was just a happenstance that uh, Camilla Russo, her team, uh, reached out and said, hey, we're talking about this Ethereum movie. And I thought, you know what, if anything's going to get us to the next level, probably a movie, but I think what she's talking about and how she wants to get us there goes beyond that. So let's jump into the uh, interview. All right, everybody. So as promised, uh, we've got a special guest, Camilla Russo from uh, The Defiant and also the author of uh, a pretty good book you might have heard about, The Infinite Machine. So Camilla, welcome to the show. Thanks for coming on. We appreciate you being here. Hey, Rob. Thanks so much for having me. Yeah. So just so you know, uh, this book's been out for a while. So we're not here to talk about the book, even though it's uh, it's pretty great. There's some tidbits we'll get into in a little bit. And also you can find uh, Camilla on her uh, Twitter account. She's also the chiefest of uh, The Defiant. Uh, it's a pretty good YouTube channel. And actually, we had that 
I did this on the show a couple of days ago where it was you and Raul Powell and your, and your co-host, and you guys talked about the different prospects of what's happening in 2021 leading into 2022. It was really fascinating. You guys have actually grown uh, uh, quite a bit uh, for that channel, so it's looking pretty good. But the thing Thanks. that we're here to, you're welcome. The thing we're here to talk about is this little gem, the infinite machine. So there is going to be a movie coming out, and I think this is going to be pretty big news for people in the Twitter, or in the, excuse me, in the crypto sphere. So tell us what's going on with that, how far are we, and how, we, uh, how can we make this a reality? Yay, super excited to talk about this. So um, as you mentioned, my book, The Infinite Machine, the first book on the history of Ethereum was published last year in July by HarperCollins. Um, this year, a, a producing studio uh, was interested in turning my book into a movie. They brought me on as an executive producer. And I had the idea of um, raising the funds to actually make the movie happen together with the Ethereum community using Ethereum technology. To me, it didn't make uh -huh. sense to be to make a, a, a movie about Ethereum without including Ethereum community into it. And uh, of course, that's how you know NFTs came into the, the table. Um, and you know, the, the whole idea was get back to into the core of the Ethereum story. So I reached out to one of the, um, uh, the, the guys who was involved in, in the design of the logo of Ethereum. And he turned out to be someone who is organizing artists in Cuba uh, to sell their art as NFTs. So mm -hmm. from there, I was like, wow, like it would be even more amazing to bring in these artists from Cuba to design this collection for the Infinite Machine. And so from there, we expanded the concept and said, Let's bring in artists from all emerging countries to, to build this collection. So we have 36 artists from Cuba, Argentina, Venezuela, Kenya, India, a uh, bunch of emerging nations uh, who uh, each produce an original piece and 10 versions of the Ethereum logo. Those uh, versions were then split in fours and then um, programmatically combined to create a collection of 10,499 unique Ethereum logos. It's the only major oh, NFT okay. collection that features the ETH logo. And I believe it's the only one too that is a platform for a really talented artists from emerging countries. So super excited about this. The sale went live for whitelisted addresses last night. Um, and it will be open for the general a public at 7 p.m. Eastern today. So if you're not today. on the white list, you're able to participate in, in the sale app as well. If the initial 2100 that we're selling aren't sold out um, from all, all the white lists, but we will have, this is kind of the first batch that we're selling and we'll have two other uh, sales in, in the next uh, few weeks. Cool. Oh, I like that. Yeah. So yeah, let's. So just real quick to take a look. Uh, you can follow this. The link will be in the description uh, for a Twitter account. So you can actually go right directly to the OpenSea, uh, the correct uh, NFTs that are for sale. So nobody gets scammed out there. I think people have uh, had that problem in the past. It takes you right here to the actual collection itself. So real quick. So Camila, breaking this down for us, because I see like, I mean. Talk to us about the, the NFT itself, uh, the, the rarity. Is there any other kind of like secondary utility for, for these types of things like some different projects do? And, and how is it all working? Yeah. So um, so there's uh, different layers, layers of rarity uh, in these NFTs. Uh, okay. The first layer is kind of the, the art. So if you get a complete work from a single artist, like one that's not uh, shuffled up, that is um, rare, that is more rare than these like mixed up pieces. The frames, yeah. the way that the frames are composed also adds a, a different layer, layer of rarity. But oh, I, I think what's, what's most interesting is these NFTs are um, a ticket into kind of the backstage of the movie. So about 30% wow. of NFTs will have a um, like a, an embedded reward in them, which uh, haven't been revealed yet. They'll be revealed at, at a later point when when all of these are, are minted. But mm -hmm. so um, one third of NFTs uh, carry the uh, ability to um, 
have different in levels of involvement in the film. Uh, for example, be an extra in the Infinite Machine movie. Um, have your NFT appear in the movie. Uh, ah. Visit the shooting sites. Um, get a VIP invite to the premiere and have your name appear on the credits of the film. <laughs> that so is pretty cool. Are, yeah. yeah, yeah, it's really cool. Um, and then further, and this is something that we'll reveal uh, more more details very soon. Um, mm -hmm. But you know, most of the the, the funds raised are going to finance uh, the movie. Uh, Twenty five percent um, go to the artist, but then ten percent goes to a community treasury okay. for NFT holders. So you know, if if you under if, if you've kind of been in the space and in and know about kind of DAOs and all that, you can start to imagine what happens to that community treasury that is being funded uh, right now. So that's also kind of in the works as well for NFT yeah. holders. That is pretty, that's pretty great. And then if you think about it, like this is why I think this is such a big deal because not only is it gonna be based on, on Ethereum and what actually happened in the history, of course, the movie, which will bring more um, eyeballs to cryptocurrency and digital asset space. But if you take a look at what you can actually do in the NFTs as far as like a movie, if you look at like traditional players in the music and entertainment industry, if they look at this and go, wow, we don't need to have these big, huge financial backers to, to move movies around. We don't need uh, these big, huge allocations to come out and actually make something happen, which is the whole point of the DAO, right? If okay. they take a look at this and people really start to understand, because that's the problem with NFTs right now, is people look and they go, that's just a JPEG and I can just right click and save it, but they don't really understand the meaning behind the meaning behind the meaning. So that could be uh, a pretty big play. All right, so sounds hey. good. Yay. So, all right. So before we, before we take off again, how can they find the information? Yeah, it's on uh, the Twitter is at ETH movie and you will find the links to the discord there, which the discord is open. Anyone can join. And that's the best place really to get all the up-to-date information and announcements. Mm -hmm. um, and then you'll find the link to OpenSea to, to get all the, the uh, NFTs that come up in the secondary market. Yeah. Um, and then the the website, uh, the infinite machine movie dot com, um, especially in the collection section is where you'll find like all the details um, about kind of the, the artist, the rivalry trades. There's also an artist section uh, that what, where you'll get to see more information about the artists uh, themselves. So if you want to kind of uh, dig deeper into this collection, um, the the website is where, where you'll, you'll find all of that. Perfect. All right. And then actually, I was, there was one more thing before we take off. I did have a question yeah. about the book. So I read the book. It was very interesting. It gave us a, a real look, you know, pull back the whole curtain and see what, how this all actually happened as far as Ethereum getting in or actually being, being made and created. There was a part in there that was, I think, the most pivotal part is that how they got around with the different issues that America has as far as with the ICO and how they said, you know what, we need to figure out a way to not, to actually pass the Howey test in some way, shape or form. And then the lawyers came about and said, you know what we need to do? We need to really take a real hard look and say, this isn't about the, the financial gain you're gonna get from investing in this project because that's a security. What we're gonna do is we're gonna focus on gas. And that is the whole thing of how they, they kind of like structured everything. How do you see that happening now with the crypto space, especially what's what with what is happening in, say, the SEC case against Ripple and XRP? Yeah, so Ethereum was really pivotal in how uh, crypto projects going forward framed uh, their structure and their fundraising uh, going forward. Like Ethereum really... Um, innovated in the the concept of the utility token so right. i think ethereum like eth is probably the original utility token so what lawyer said is you know eth isn't a share of ethereum owners of eth don't own um a piece of a company they're not entitled to a share of revenue it this doesn't look anything like stock but what it is is more like 
like a commodity, like like fuel. You know, it's like ETH is what is used to make this machine run. Um, mm -hmm. So ETH is used to pay for computation inside this network. So it's really it, it really has use inside inside the network. It's not meant to kind of represent an investment. And mm -hmm. I think lots of projects going forward use this exact same um, concept and structure to avoid any problems uh, with, with regulators. In the end, what was key for, for Ethereum and the reason why um, the SEC and the CFTC have come out and say Ethereum is in the clear, it's not a security, it's a commodity, it's actually, maybe it has something to do with this concept of utility token, but the key issue here is decentralization. So the fact mm -hmm. that Ethereum is actually decentralized and has thousands of nodes and there's not one person or party who controls it, that's what kind of has kept it safe. Perfect. Well, I know that Gary watches my channel, so hopefully he's listening. All right, Camilla, thanks so much <laughs> for coming on the channel. I appreciate it. And then for all of you that are watching right now, links are in the description. Go take a look at that, uh, the NFT collection, and then we'll go from there. Camilla, Yay. thanks so much. Thanks so much, Rob. All right, so I hope that made sense. Uh, I want to thank Camilla for coming on. You can find all the information again in the links in the description. And then lastly, I'm not going to talk about it here, but uh, there's a project. We've been uh, looking more at uh, play to earn games for obvious reasons, which I've laid out numerous times. And I think this one's going to be pretty big. This one's called Everdome, and I did a review. It's over on Dan Clips. We do all deep dives and things, advancements in crypto over there and leave this just the news. So I will just say that uh, with this, with Everdome, uh, you have really a trifecta. You got Everdome, the blockchain Tencent, and you have MetaHero all working together to make this super realistic metaverse play. And if you believe in what I call the UTT, which is uh, the utility, the team, and the tokenomics, this one has them all. All right, so that's it for today. So look, if you liked today's video and uh, you found some value, give it a thumbs up. Also consider subscribing. A lot of things we talk about are time sensitive, and that's it for today. So thanks so much for watching. I appreciate it, and I'll see you in the next one.